Okay, let's go ahead and begin our discussion of homework two for the MA120 course. One of the first things before starting the homework that you're going to want to obtain is a copy of the Excel template that is going to be used to assist us to do the calculations involved for homework two. This process is going to be the very same when it comes to the remaining homework assignments for this course. First thing you want to do is you're going to want to log into Canvas, uh, go to your MA120 course, and then once you get there, you want to click on Modules. And then for Homework 2, you're going to notice if I come down to Unit 1's template, there's going to be a link here that says ME120 Homework 2 Template. You're going to want to click on that. And then you'll notice that on the main screen, it's going to show you a representation of the template, but you don't want to use that that's listed down here. What you're going to want to do is come up here to the link where it says download MA120 Homework 2 template. Click on that. Whatever means that inside your browser using Firefox or Chrome or Internet Explorer, you're going to want to open that given file. It'll take a second or two here to process. Then after it opens, this is critical to ensure that you're working well inside of the templates. It will, depending on the version of Excel that you have, odds are you're probably running Excel 2016 or 13 or a previous version. It's going to prompt you with this button that's called Enable Editing. You're going to want to click on that because you can't do anything inside of the spreadsheet until that button is clicked. If you don't, you can't modify anything inside of the given template. So I now have Homework 2's template open. I'm going to go ahead and minimize that for the time being. Don't close it, but I'm just going to minimize that because now I'm going to come back into my stat lab and I'm going to go to Homework. And you're going to want to open up Homework 2's assignment. I'm going in as a little different from an instructor's perspective, but uh, you'll want to open up Homework 2's assignment here off to the right. So I'm going to go ahead and move this guy over to the left-hand screen, kind of resize that so that everybody can see what's going on with it. And uh, we're going to go ahead and go back to our Excel template. And I'm going to move this guy over to the right. That way, on the same screen, I can see what's going on relative to uh, the template on the left hand side, as well as on the right hand, or uh, template on the right hand side, as well as showing uh, the uh, the homework on the left, so you can work with them concurrently. All right. So first things first, when I take a look at problem number one, I'm going to resize this just a hair so we can see everything there. First one is we have a series of classes here. And from these classes, we're going to analyze the class width, class midpoint, class boundaries. And this information is going to be calculated off to the right here inside of the Excel template. You'll notice for our source data on this first problem, 45 to 47 has 1, 48 to 50 has 3, and so on. I don't want to have to sit and type all of this source data into this Excel template. So you will notice on a handful of problems, there's going to be these two boxes that I'm hovering over right here. This is going to allow us to use the clipboard functionality to copy and paste this from, uh, from my stat lab into the Excel template. So first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to click on that click to copy paste. I'm going to click on the option that says open in Excel. Again, whatever mechanism that's used when the browser shows it, I'm showing this inside of Firefox. I'm going to click open with. And then again, you want to ensure that you're clicking on enable editing. From here, I need to copy this data into the Excel template. So the process to do that, I'm going to highlight all of the given cells that are there. Then I'm going to come up here to the top and do click either on the copy button or you'll notice on the screen if you do the shortcut key of hitting the control and the C as in Charlie at the same time, that will copy into memory, into the clipboard, 
all of those respective values, okay? So you'll notice it's copied when the dash lines start blinking across the screen. That ensures that now it's in memory to be copied over to here. I'm going to come back into the template, select cell A1, and then I'm going to hit the paste button. The alternative way of doing that is to do a control V as in Victor. If I hit that paste button, notice the 135, 11, 7, 7, and 1 have been refreshed inside of the given data. I'm going to go ahead and close this one because I don't need it anymore. And now I'm ready to answer the corresponding questions. The first one says, what is the class width? Well, between 45 and 47, if you count the numbers of 45, which is the first, 46 is being the second, and 47 being the third, there's a total of three values you could put inside of that class. You'll notice over here as well, Excel has calculated for every single one of those classes the value of three. So three is the correct answer for the class width. You would come over here and type in the value of three. The second is, what is the class midpoint? Class midpoint, if I look at 45, 46, 47, what's the smack dab middle value is 46. 48 to 50, what's the middle value is 49, and so on. Those values here that I've highlighted, the 46, 49, all the way down to 64, is what you would type in as the class midpoints for those values. The remaining component on this is what is the class boundary. The smallest value that would go into 45 through 47 would be the value of 44.5. Smallest value to 48 to 50 would be 47.5 and so on. These values from 44.5 to 65.5 is what you would type in as your correct answers to problem number one there for the last part. This completes problem number one. Let's take a look at problem number two here. Problem number two is asking a question, is this frequency appear to have normal distribution? Well, if something was truly normally distributed, that would mean it would look like the shape of the bell curve, where the majority of the values would sit smack dab in the middle of this curve. You'll notice there is a total of one, two, three, four, five, six, seven classes. I would suspect if I group the three there, the three there, and this one being the middle, that if it had this shape, that the majority of the values would sit in the middle. And it looks like that middle class, the 55 through 59, does have 13 observations. However, the other half would have to be sitting on the left, and the other portion would have to sit on the right. You'll notice if I take the sum of 2 plus 0 plus 6, I've got 8 over here. And notice if I take 9, 7, and 1, uh, let's see, 9 plus 7 is 16 and 1 is 17. You'll notice that the bulk of the data is sitting on the right-hand side of this particular curve, which would mean if I drew this, it would probably look something like this, where it would small increase and the bulk would be sitting over here to the right. For it to be normal, the bulk has to sit in the middle, and they have to be pretty evenly distributed between it. In this case, it's substantially more on the right, which yields that this does not appear to be normal from our analysis that we just did on problem number two. Let's take a look at problem number three here. You'll notice inside the template for each question that that utilizes the Excel template is going to have a corresponding tab. If I'm working on question three, I need to select question three's tab. So you'll notice right now, if I was on question one, I would have selected question one's tab. I would have clicked on question three's tab if I want to do work inside of question three. So I'm on question three, I'm on question three's tab. It says construct one table, include all relative frequencies based on frequency distribution shown below. Then compare the amount of tar in non-filtered and filtered cigarettes. Do the uh, cigarette filters appear to be effective? Well, in this case, I got to get the source data into the template over here on the right-hand side of the screen. So make that a little bit bigger so everybody can see it. Now I'm ready to go ahead and do the copy-paste like I did before. 
I got to click on that tab to open this. And you'll notice just like the previous problem on question one, I need to copy and paste this into the template up here. So I'm going to click on click to copy table and open in Excel. So if I do that, click the open, click enable editing. I need to highlight all of those respective cells and then whatever mechanism control C to copy or to use the copy up here at the top. So I'll do that. This time I did a control C as in Charlie. It's now highlighted. I now come into cell A1. You want to place your cursor or the cell inside of A1. Do a control V to paste. And notice the data has been refreshed in this particular case. So now we're ready to answer our corresponding questions. So for the non-filtered, notice the first set when I look at the answers down here of non-filtered, the first class that comes into play is the 14 to 17. For six to nine, you don't have a value over here, so you key in zero. 10 to 13 on the non-filtered, doesn't have an entry, key in zero. 14 to 17, notice 8% is listed there, I would key in 8%. 18 to 21 is zero, key in zero. 22 to 25 is 56%, would have keyed in the 56. 26 to 29 was 32%, matching that. 30 to 33 was four, keyed in that there. Now we go into the filtered cigarette part. And in this case, you've got entries starting at six to nine. Six to nine is showing as 8%, keyed in there. 10 to 13 is 8%, would have keyed into there. 14 to 17 would have been 28%, keyed into there. 18 to 21 is 56% keyed into there. Notice I don't have an entry for 22 to 25 over here on the right. Same with 26 to 29 and 30 to 33. All three of those values would have been keyed in as zero. So that completes the first part of the problem. In this case, if I look at, do cigarette filters appear to be effective? Yes, because if I look at this, the relative frequency of higher tar cigarettes is greater than non-filtered. So you'll notice the bulk of the data is sitting in a higher frequency versus in non-filtered. So I would have answered yes, based upon the percentages of the roll up of the data that is listed on problem number three here. That completes that one. Question number four, we have this listed frequency table. I need to apply the cumulative frequency to these guys. Same as before, we have source data that needs to go into the template. I'm going to click on that button, open in Excel, enable my editing, highlight the source data that's listed there, do your copy, the control C is the way that I did it there. And now I'm going to come back in, select cell A1 inside the template. Do a control V as in vector to paste and refresh the data. Notice 236, 14, 9, 7, 1, matching the 236, 14, 9, 7, 1 for the problem presented. Now, how do you find a cumulative frequency? For the first class, the numbers are going to match identically. So that's going to be 2. To get to the value of 5, I need to add 2 and 3 together, which is 5. Notice showing as the correct answer to the second class. Notice the first one, the two, match the two there. The five match the five and can repeat that for the others. Now, how did we get 11? You take the previous of five, add it to six, you get 11. 11 to 14, you get 25. Take the previous one at 25 to nine to accumulate to 34. 34 and seven gets me 41. 41 and the one gets me the last entry of 42. So notice two, five, 11, 25, 34, 41 and 42, matching the correct answers that Excel has returned to us for problem number four. For problem number five, we have a series of 20 observations. You're welcome to type all 20 of those in to the first column here. However, we do have that mechanism, just like in the previous problems, where I can copy and paste. So I'm going to go ahead and do that here. Open in Excel. Takes a second or two to open up the source data for this problem. Click your enable editing. I'm going to highlight all 
20 of those observations. Control C to copy. I'm now going to come back into the template, do a Control V as in Victor to paste, and notice that the data has been refreshed. Now I'm ready to answer the first question. 15 to 20.9, three, matching the frequency. What that's doing is it's giving all values that are between 15 and 20.9. So notice there's three of them in the source data that represents that uh, in this case. Uh, the remaining ones do the exact same thing and Excel is already accounting for doing those counts. So 21 to 26.9 matches nine there. 27 to 32.9, the value of four obtained from there. 33 to 38.9 is three obtained there. And 39 to 44.9, you have one observation inside of this list, which is that guy right there from the source data, okay? So that takes care of the first piece. It says next, does the frequency distribution appear to be roughly a normal distribution? Well, again, let me get my pen active here. The goal is if I'm looking at this particular source data, and again, if I attempt to draw a normal curve, the bulk needs to sit in the middle and equal, pretty equal on both sides. Five classes, the middle class here is four. So I got four there. If I add up these two, three and nine is gonna give me 12, and three and one is four. You'll notice the bulk of the data this time is sitting on the left-hand side, which means this is not uh, normally distributed because the bulk would have needed to sit inside of the middle class for this to be accurate. So if I look at this guy, does it appear to be roughly a normal distribution? No, although the frequencies start low, increase to some maximum, then decrease, the distribution is not symmetric. In other words, that same analysis that we just did on this problem. So no, uh, in this case, uh, frequencies start low, increase to some maximum, then decrease, the distribution is not symmetric. Answering question number five here. Let's look at question number six here. We have some source data that we need to copy into the Excel template. So again, notice when you see the box there, that is our click to copy table. I'm gonna click open in an Excel and open up this guy here. Always click your enable editing. And then I'm gonna highlight those that source data, control C to copy. And now I'm gonna come back into the template do a control V as in Victor. Notice that the data now has been refreshed. The relative frequencies, the way that that is calculated. If I take 437, the individual uh, observation divided by the sum of it, which is 1702. Let me show this in the calculator here. Do this down. If I take 437 divided by 1702, which is the total quantity, and multiply that by 100, notice I get 25.67. Round to the nearest tenth, the seven causes me to round up to a seven, which is what Excel is showing as that calculation. Again, if I took 88 divided by 1702 and converted it to a percentage, you get 5.2 and so on for the remaining options. So 25.7 matching the 25.7 for pilot error, 5.2 for other human error, weather is 7.5%, mechanical 39.8%, and sabotage 21.9%. So that answers the first piece of that problem. Then if I scroll down, it says, what is the most serious threat to aviation safety? If I look at this uh, data here, which percentage is the largest? And that occurs inside of mechanical problems that I just highlighted. The largest percentage, which is close to 40%, represents mechanical problems as the highest of the five scenarios that we were presented. So notice letter B is selected saying, mechanical problems are the most serious threat to aviation safety. New planes could be better engineered. So mechanical problems, since it's the largest value, helped us answer the last part of question six. You will notice starting on the screen right now, the template is not used for problems seven through 15. So I've maximized the screen without the Excel template. The rest of it will be done by hand or an analysis question that you'll be able to answer without the Excel template. So this one, 
one way we can summarize data or a view that managers love and team leads love is what's called a histogram. A histogram is a, a, a visual representation of given data. So you'll notice for the 110 group, you'll notice that the vertical line represents the quantity that represents that class. So for 110, you notice the line between zero and two, well, the middle of that is gonna be one. 130 goes between four and six, so we've got five. 150 and 170 goes up to the two line, so for each of those are the value of two. 190 goes up to the four line, which is four. 210 doesn't have any, so it's zero. 230 goes up to the four line. So how many are represented in this? Well, I just need to take the sum of one plus five plus two plus two plus four plus zero plus four. One and five is six, two more is eight, two more is 10, 10 plus four is 14, 14 plus zero is 14 and another four for a grand total of 18, which matches our correct answer to problem number seven. All right, let's look at problem number eight. It says the last digit of the heights of 59 statistics students were obtained as part of an experiment conducted for a class using frequency distribution to the right to construct a histogram. So what I'm looking at out of these four histograms here, which one represents the data the most accurate? Well, sometimes on the problems, there will be a button here that you can expand, but I'm gonna look at one that's wrong and then one that's right relative to the source data. So I'm gonna to try to make this a little bit bigger so we can see what's going on. So uh, for letter A, I'm gonna analyze A as a wrong answer and then B as a correct answer to show you what's going on with it. Well, for zero, letter A shows 16. So that one, I would probably buy since it's smack dab in the middle between zero and 36. That one is probably okay. So for the first one, let me get my pen back. For the first one, I'm all probably okay that it's 16. Zero, I'm gonna put a check mark. For one, that guy only shows a five. So I would have suspected that line to be drawn somewhere down here. So we've shown at the point of one, this is not representing the data as listed. So, um, for letter A, that's obviously not correct. I'm gonna clear my markings here and now show relative to the data what's going on. So zero, we're at 16. Notice the hash marks are between zero and 18. So uh, that one shows it's 16, that one looks good. At one, we're at five, which would suspect a little higher than three or four, so that one looks good. Two, we're at three, and as well as three, because those two values there those look good. For four, we're at four. That one also looks good. Five is at 13. So I would suspect it's a little bit lower than that first one and that one checks out. And then if I, and I need to scroll down here so we can look at the source data. We erase a little check marks here. Okay, so now I'm back in business. For six, we've got the line of four, which should be about the same height as what that one was. Seven is just a tick higher, and then eight and nine is the same height as two and three. So everything checks out that letter B is our correct answer. Now, I'm gonna pause here for a second. Second part of this asks is, are the data reported or measured? It is reported. They're disproportional at time because it jumps up and down, up and down. But the data is actually being reported based upon this frequency table. So if we take a look at letter B, the data was reported. It doesn't have a nice normal shape as we talked about earlier from homework two perspective, but the data is being reported in this particular case. Letter A, um, it's disproportionate times versus D, it's being reported, but they're roughly the same frequency. They're not, they jump all over the place because zero and five there are spikes or different heights inside of the given data. That completes problem number eight. For problem number nine, this is the same as problem eight, so I'm not gonna go through the analysis of it. Use your mechanism from problem number eight that you did on that problem and should be able to do the same analysis 
to come up with your correct answers on these particular problems. So uh, nine is very similar to problem number eight, so I won't go through the analysis of that given problem. Number 10, we're doing similar type of information this time with the given classes, identify the corresponding histogram off to the right. 39 to 44 is one. Notice very similar to what we did in problems eight through nine, I would suspect that that is the lowest. For letter B, two, so a little bit higher. C, a little bit higher than that. Bulk is sitting at the middle on D with 12. E, F, and G start to decrease 7, 1, and 1, respectively, showing D is the correct answer. Now, if I get my pen back, this guy looks pretty normal. Bulk is sitting at the middle, roughly half of it on the left and half of it on the right. So I can draw this as the corresponding normal curve here. So this guy is approximately normal, answering problem, or the second part of this, letter B, that it's approximately normal. Same analysis we did earlier, where the bulk should sit at the middle, and then roughly half of it on the left, half of it on the right. So I can kind of draw the normal curve based upon that histogram that's listed on part D, completing problem number 10. Number 11 is very similar to problem number 10. I'm not gonna go through uh, the complete analysis. You'll notice letter C represents by the frequencies. Notice 25, 20 to 30, it's got 25 listed and can complete that same analysis the same way that you did on problem 10. The only uh, thing I wanna make mention, this does not look like a normal curve, so it's not symmetric, nor is it approximately normal. The bulk of the data is sitting on the left, so if I attempted to draw a normal curve on letter C being the correct answer, it's not going to be symmetric on this one for problem number 11. Number 12 is very similar to problem number 11. Again, we'll not go through the analysis because we've done the same thing on the previous one. Take the frequencies, identify the corresponding curve, as well as your analysis question that I will leave for you to answer. But again, you answer based on normal being smack dab in the middle or approximately normal in the middle, and then the left and the right looking like that bell-shaped curve. So I'll leave that one for you to complete for problem number 12. Let's look at problem number 13. This is a new type of graph that we haven't seen yet, which is called a scatter diagram or a scatter plot in this case. I'm gonna take the relationship between TAR and CO, take these points here and try to identify if they match the corresponding graph. Well, I'm gonna show one that's incorrect, how I make the determination that it's incorrect, and then analyze the remaining points that are listed here to analyze if they're correct or not. So I'm gonna pull up letter B in this case, and you'll notice for the first value here, the 1615, I'm looking to see if I see a 1615 here, and you'll notice for 16, I need to see if there is a value of 15. Notice 12, that should be 13 here. So for this point here, let me get my pen, the first one that was illustrated here that I'm taking a look at, that guy is 16 for the first value and 13 for that one. If I come back to the source data on this one, You'll notice that the first entry was 16 and 15. So 16 and 15 there, that first counterexample puts B as an incorrect answer. Now, I'm gonna show a handful of these points and you would analyze all 15 of these ordered pairs to analyze what's going on with this one. So if I look at C here, 1615 is what I'm looking at for the first point, 16, I'm gonna come over here to this point right there, and you'll notice, let's see here, 16, that guy is a, there may be another point that is at 16, 15. Sorry, this one, let me erase my eraser here. Come on. There we go, I wanna get rid of that one. 
The first one that I just circled there is my 1615 in this case. So uh, I've got 16, I go across then up. So that one's 1615, which matches. I would do that for the remaining points and you'll notice all 16 of these points are going to uh, match up for problem number C. Now you'll notice the trend of this particular data, and let me close out uh, this guy here first, looks like as one increases, the other one increases, which has uh, kind of an upward or a straight line relationship. That's what that one looks like, kind of in the pattern of that scatter plot. This one, as, one it, as the tar increases, the CO decreases, which we know that doesn't occur. It should be a direct relationship that would be positive, similar to this guy. Based upon that information, I need to be able to answer uh, those questions. B is all over the place. I have no idea what that relationship is. And D was kind of similar, but if you would have analyzed the points, they're not going to match up. So let me clear out the drawings and take a look at, based upon that one tar increasing CO increases, that's what I'm looking for as my answer. And yes, there we go, letter C. Yes is the amount of tar increases, the amount of CO increases, because we showed that as an upward line, as the tar increased, the CO also increased in that case. Completing problem number 13. Question number 14, we're looking at a frequency polygon, which is another way to analyze the given data. From this one, I'm gonna take the classes and I'm looking at the first one being six. So my first observation, if I come over here to the correct answer, notice the scales are between zero through 25. So I'm looking at five, 10, 15, 20, and at the very top, 25. That first point there is between five and 10. So that's matching the six. Five to 8.99, I'm looking at the second value there which is matching at 20, which that one looks good. For nine to 12.99, I'm down between zero and five. So I'm looking at that third point, that one matches up. 13 to 16.99, I'm looking at nine. So I should be somewhere between five and 10. So that guy right there is showing between the values. And then last but not least, the last point there of 10 is right at the 10 hash mark. So everything is nicely matching up on that frequency polygon. You'll notice this curve does not even remotely look normally distributed. Your bulk of the data is sitting off to the left. So you'll notice strict interpretation on that. Again, this third one that was listed there should have been the highest of the group. So the frequency polygon does not appear to uh, approximate a normal distribution because I don't have, it goes up, reaches the top and then falls down. So letter A showing the correct answer to problem number 14. Number 15, we're looking at a series of graphs here and from the graphs, kind of giving misleading in information relative to the way that the graph is drawn. If I look at this particular graph, not paying attention to the vertical indices here, it looks like men are making twice as much relative to the size of that histogram and yes, I apologize, women should make the same amount as men. However, based upon the data that's out there, based on the factual data that's out there, it is true that uh, women only make roughly about 80 cents on the dollar relative to men. It's not the right thing, but again, that's what the data provides us. So again, relative to this, you'll notice that it's roughly about half of the size there, but that's not the case relative if I look at these particular guys here. So what impression does the graph create? The graph creates the impression that men have salaries more than twice the salaries of women, which is what we just analyzed here in this question. Does the graph depict it fairly? No, because women are making roughly, what is it, 57, 58,000 relative to men making 70,000. What would have helped with this one is if the scale would have been at zero, that way, it would have showed roughly about that 80% relationship between the two. So letter A is showing as the correct answer. The vertical scale does not start at zero. If it would have started at zero, we would have had a better representation of the given data. And let me scroll down here. What 
would look accurate. Letter B, just as we stated, notice it was right at 60,000. This one is showing accurately here. The men was at 70,000, so 60, 80,000 should have been in the middle. You'll notice letter A, uh, 60,000, 80,000. Women did not make 70,000 because women were at about the 57,000, so A is not correct. B, again, it didn't start at zero. We're back to square one on this one again. It's not showing it accurately. So we should, when you start showing the comparisons between the two, we really need to start at zero so it shows more of an accurate relationship relative to the salaries. This completes the demonstration for homework two.